Hello, my name is Amelia Fontenelle. I'm a curator at the RIT Cary Graphic Arts Collection. We are a rare book library that specializes in the many forms of graphic communication, including printing, graphic design, and the book arts. Today, I want to focus on type specimens, which are a particularly strong area of our collection. For those of you new to this genre of documents, Type specimens are sheets or books printed by printers, type founders, or publishers to show what types are available and their appearance. They are essentially catalogs that give consumers of the type creative ideas about how it can be used. For our purposes, I'm going to focus on printed specimens in the Carey Collection. This talk is the result of class visits that I had prepared for Professor Chris Holmes who taught type design at RIT. She wanted her students to see the evolution of type specimens so they could be inspired to design their own. A few things to note. For the early part of this talk, I am showing specimens of analog metal and wood type that were used for letterpress relief printing. And the companies that manufactured the metal type were actual foundries that cast the type. Hence the term we now use for a company that creates and sells even digital type, we call it a type foundry. So let's dive right in. Here is a book published during the Italian Renaissance by the famed writing master Giovanni Palatino. By this time, letterpress printing in the Western world had been used for over 100 years. The illustrations in this book are not printed from metal type though, they are woodcuts. This is not a type specimen. This is a copy book or calligraphy manual with models of alphabets for students to copy for practice. But the important point is that the format that the type specimen eventually adopted to show printed alphabets had a precedent in this genre of copy books that showcased letter forms, sizes, and styles. To compare, Conrad Berner's type specimen is one of the earliest European specimens on record. It was printed some 44 years after the Palatino book. We at the Cary only have a facsimile of this piece. Like Palatino's copy book, we can see different letter forms, like the upright Roman versions of the Garamond typeface, with its italic designed by Robert Granjon, as well as various sizes from about 48 point, called the canon here, to 6 point, called the non pareil. Incidentally, the text he printed to show the type is from the Book of Isaiah from the Vulgate Bible. Also important in this type specimen are the decorations, like borders of typographic ornaments and leaf florons that mimic human embellishment done customarily in calligraphy. As we'll see, calligraphy and type design have always been close companions. Berner's specimen was a broadsheet, or a broadside, as opposed to a codex-bound book. A broadside is a large piece of paper that is printed on one side. This format never really goes out of style when promoting type. Next here is William Caslon I's 1738 specimen of 38 fonts in 16 sizes in 11 languages. Eight of those languages use non-Latin alphabet systems. This particular specimen was featured as a fold-out plate in an encyclopedia, but it does not differ much from the burner specimen. Type is put on display in columns in descending point size with typographic ornaments at the bottom. These are for printers to make a visual judgment about what to buy for their metal type collections. It's kind of a try it before you buy it. Since we jumped about 150 years in the last comparison, let's zoom light speed ahead to 1950. I'm showing the Times of London's type specimen broadside for their iconic super typeface family, the Times New Roman. Not deviating much from the Caslon and Burner specimens, the broadside format is again reaffirmed 
as it offers a comprehensive quick glance to compare font sizes and styles. In this way, it's a successful information design solution for a lot of nuanced content. And even though digital typefaces can now be examined in such fine detail with infinite permutations on the websites of type foundries, we continue to see broadsides being printed for promotion. Here is the Hera Big digital typeface family in all its juicy stylistic variations. It was presented as a broadside or poster for the 2011 TypeCon conference. Yes, the content may have been created as eye candy for typographers, but make no mistake, this is a commercial document that is meant to entice designers to buy this type in the very same spirit as Burner, Caslon, and The Times. Let's circle back to Caslon. The type foundry that William Caslon launched in England in the 1730s continued well into the 20th century under various Caslon family members. During their time in business, the specimen broadsheet was only one tier of their marketing efforts. Enter type specimen books as a format. While the broadside serves a purpose as a ready reference for showing type, the books could offer a deeper dive with extended passages to really simulate a reading environment. Multi-page books could also include more designs as a foundry's typeface offerings expanded into myriad classifications. This early Caslon specimen is fairly slim, but one can read through it with a good understanding of what they sold. One of the masterpieces of the genre is Giambattista Badoni's 1818 two-volume Manuale Typografico of 276 types in various sizes and languages with ornaments. This is a rather luxurious type specimen when compared with Caslon, as Bedoni printed for an aristocratic patron, the Duke of Parma. This patronage exempted him from the real economics of selling type to printers. Rather, his Manuale specimen, published posthumously by his widow, is a limited edition resume of his Didone typographic innovations of slender, upright letter forms with fine serifs. I especially want to point out the sumptuous wide margins. Paper is one of the costliest expenses in book production. The page design alone puts the Manuale into the fine press classification of type specimens. As the Industrial Revolution impacted consumerism in the 19th century, marketing messaging proliferated to sell the goods produced in factories. With this increase in advertising, typeface design changed to offer more eye-catching variation. These new display or decorative typeface families called for type specimens that showed off ornamentation, distortions in width, weight, and serifs, as well as an introduction of color printing. I have been paging through a specimen book of wood type by the Connecticut-based William H. Page Company. Please note the format change. This specimen is a collected volume of house organs or short promotional periodicals issued in installments. With this short publication cycle, the type manufacturer could respond quickly to market trends. Machine-made paper printed on an auto-fed cylinder press with machine-routed wood type. This specimen is a much different specimen from the painstaking craftsmanship that went into Bedoni's Manuale, which was hand-printed on an iron hand press with hand-cast type. The Industrial Revolution also introduced large volume type manufacturing by machines for a more literate public. This is a type specimen of Arabic fonts that were available for the automatic typecasting machine called the Linotype, invented in about 1884. This system was in place in newspapers around the world because texts could be typeset by keyboard and the type would be cast on the fly. Hand typesetting time was greatly reduced for a daily publication. Even this specimen, for an Arabic-speaking consumer base, follows the typical formula for type specimens thus far. 
typefaces presented in different sizes and styles with showings of typographic ornaments. And moving through the early 20th century, type specimens are often reiterations of similar page layouts using the codex or book format. Let's look at a case study of the typefaced astray through time. It was first offered in 1921 for sale by the Parisian foundry De Berny et Peignot. Its American distributor, Continental Type Founders, released a conservative two-page astray spread in its 1929 specimen book. This was followed by De Berny and Peignot's similar presentation of astray in 1935. It was one of the hundreds of typefaces offered in its comprehensive two-volume specimen catalog. Note the quick access tab sections on the book's fore edge. These were organized by typeface classification. In the 1950s, Astray again appears as a reprisal of a backlist font in De Bernier and Peño's post-war specimen. I don't see a lot of change in the marketing strategies over 30 years of trying to sell this typeface. The bindings for the books get more sophisticated in design, but that showing of types by size with sales copy or appropriate allusive wording remains constant. The introduction of phototype setting in the mid 20th century changes a lot of approaches in the sales of types. This technology shift ushers in the use of stroboscopic light and film exposure for lithographic printing instead of metal founding for the manufacture of letterpress type. This is a photo composition film disc that replaced analog metal relief letterpress characters in typesetting. Large codex type specimens are still in production during this era, but the primary source record also shows a lot of production of ephemeral pamphlet or brochure specimens, like this one for the first phototype superfamily, the Sans Serif Univers, designed by Adrian Frutiger and released by Debeni and Peignot in 1957. Specimens increasingly added illustrations and photographic images to their font examples. And for brevity in such a shortened format, those typeface samples are often condensed into simple alphabet strings or line showings. Less common are the long passages to see how the text fares in an extended reading scenario. The photo typesetting era was so short-lived, only lasting from the mid-1950s until the early 1980s. But it was crucial for setting up the wave of digital type enabled by desktop publishing in the mid-1980s. That transformation deserves to be a whole course on its own, as do a lot of other topics I've touched on here. What I do want to show to conclude this lecture are some highlights in digitally designed and printed type specimens from the Carey Collection. Even though the actual design product of type resides in a non-physical cloud or as bytes on a hard drive, we humans are still producing creative printed type specimens. A groundbreaking digital typeface was Zapfino, designed by Hermann Zaff and released about 1998 by Linotype, which by then was retooled as a digital foundry, not a typesetting machine manufacturer. Zapfino's script has such a comprehensive set of alternate characters that when combined appropriately, it can approximate the variation of hand calligraphy. Linotype's specimen pamphlet shows off these features and even includes a reproduction of Zaff's original calligraphy from his archive further evidence that type and calligraphy have inspired each other for centuries. Master printer designers in the spirit of Bodoni also continue to publish sumptuous specimen books in the digital age. This is Russell Merritt's Ornamental Digressions. It shows his suite of whimsical ornaments. It was a letterpress printed in multiple colors through digitally designed photopolymer plates and metal type. Only 100 copies of this fine press edition were offered for sale, mostly to institutions and collectors. 
His target audience is not the general font-buying public. Some modern specimens combine the best features of printing craftsmanship with high-speed production. This is a collection of type specimen chapbooks that are regularly published by P22 Type Foundry. All of the content pages are digitally designed and printed with offset lithography. Most of them, however, add a tactile touch as they are bound with a letterpress cover printed by hand. A developing genre of the 21st century are specimens that feature typefaces from languages that have traditionally been underrepresented in the historical record. This is Jamra Patel's Kaigilia specimen book. This typeface successfully unifies 10 diverse African scripts into one superfamily. While the specimen is a slim book of only 54 pages, it not only gives a comprehensive showing of each alphabet, it also provides valuable information about the geography and demographics of the people who speak the languages. This specimen actually teaches the reader while selling fonts. And speaking of sales, the current practice of marketing fonts is not limited to books, pamphlets, and broadsides, plus the internet. Type consumers love merchandise with typographic illustrations. Pictured here are miniature type specimens, coasters, tools, spoofy, funny books, stickers, and postcards. I myself own typographic t-shirts, mugs, pins, and tote bags, and they were all released by type foundries to promote their typefaces. I wonder if William Caslon would have jumped on this bandwagon were he alive. That the type specimens of the future have a lot to learn from the rich exemplars from the past. My final slides highlight what the future may hold with type specimens by the budding designer students in Professor Holmes' RIT classes. I think those students absorbed some nuggets of information from their visit to the Carey Collection. Here are some of their type specimen broadsides. These ones advertise black letter typefaces based on the student's own hand calligraphy. Many of them created specimen pamphlets and books using varying binding styles to show off their typefaces. And these innovative formats fan out, fold up, or are packaged in a stylish way. It seems that the type specimen genre has few limits in creative expression. I'm really looking forward to revising this talk in a decade to report on the landscape of innovative type specimens to come. Ones that include animation, are variable in weight and width, and hybrids of analog and digital technology are all on our horizon. But thanks now for traveling along with me thus far.